Welcome to the recorded version of the Grantmakers in Aging web seminar, The Boomer Explosion, a creative look at aging and communities. Featuring Tim Carpenter, founder of Engage and host and producer of the Experience Talks radio show. Mark Friedman, CEO and founder of Civic Ventures. Gay Hanna, executive director of the National Center for Creative Aging. And John Feather, CEO of Grantmakers in Aging. From November 5th, 2012. This event was made possible by a partnership between Grantmakers in Aging and the John A. Hartford Foundation. Technical and production support is provided by the American Society on Aging. And at this point, I would like to welcome John Feather, Grantmakers and Aging CEO to the floor, who's going to be moderating today's session. Welcome, John. Thanks, Steve. And welcome to everyone to this edition of Conversations with GIA. As Steve said, my name is John Feather. I'm the CEO of Grantmakers and Aging, and I'm delighted that so many of you have joined us today. Before we start, I want to thank the John A. Hartford Foundation of New York for providing continuing support for this webinar series, the MetLife Foundation for their sponsorship of the Grantmakers Partnership Project, and to Grantmakers in the Arts and Grantmakers in Health for their co-sponsorship of today's session. I also want to thank the expert team at the American Society on Aging for providing technical and production support for the series. Turning to our topic today, how will communities respond to the 78 million Americans who will be over the age of 65 by the year 2030, less than 20 years from now? Today's webinar focuses on how the boomers who are redefining, this, are redefining the second half of life are looking to both cultural and aging organizations to meaningfully engage in this next phase. The conversation will focus on innovation, sustaining work later in life, creativity, lifelong learning, and much more, all within the context of the cultural sector. We are glad to have three experts with us today to talk about this important issue and the ways in which philanthropy can be involved. Our guests today are Tim Carpenter, the founder and executive director of Engage and host and producer of Experience Talks, Mark Friedman, the found, founder and CEO of Encore.org, and Gay Hanna, the Executive Director of the National Center for Creative Aging. Welcome, Tim, Mark, and Gay. Thank you. We're Thanks, Gay, let's, let's get started with you as we move to our next slide. You're facilitating an unusual partnership to bring together the arts, aging, and health. Could you tell us something about that program? Oh, thank you, John, and thank you all for being with us this, this morning, our East Coast this afternoon. <laughs> Uh, yes, this partnership actually began uh, the fall of 20, uh, 20, 2009, and very organically, NCCA was asked to present at an affinity group meeting, Grant Makers in the Arts in New York City, and within a month, we were invited to present in front of Grant Makers in Aging's affinity group around the issues of aging and workforce development. Our uh, partners, the MetLife Foundation, were in attendance and saw the great enthusiasm and really uh, the need to provide information about this cross-cutting uh, topic that really focuses on the potential around aging and the power of creativity. So this program specifically is aimed to give technical assistance to funders who would like to explore, start, or expand programs to support the use of arts, focusing on issues uh, around longevity, aging, health, and education. And as John uh, started with his introduction, we now have grant makers in aging, grant makers in the arts, and this year, grant makers in health joined us, along with another national service organization, the Society for Arts and Healthcare. Wonderful. Uh, tell us a little bit, uh, in addition to the MetLife Foundation, how has philanthropy been involved in this project? Well, we're just thrilled to, to now have over 300 uh, foundations involved in this project. And thanks to Grant Makers and Aging, we've been able to help whole forums in Arizona and New York, Grant Makers in the Arts, 
uh, we held a thought leader forum in Washington, D.C. in 2011, and uh, we'll be holding a national strategy session with Grant Makerson Health in May of this coming year, 2013. Uh, we've been able to produce with and for funders over a dozen conference sessions in all the affinity groups involved as well as webinars such as this. And we look to be pr producing at least three publications that will give ongoing support. So again, all of our activities are planned and uh, organized in great cooperations with the funders involved. That's and great. That you'll if, if we be able to see Mark and Tim uh, in person at Grant Makers in Health in March uh, at their conference in San Francisco. That's that's uh, that's great to have so much involvement in such a short time. So, um, so uh, Gay, once again, could you tell us a little bit uh, more about the National Center for Creative Aging and uh, how you became involved in this project? Sure. Well, we. Uh, actually are a nonprofit organization. We're classified as a national service organization, and we were created in 2001 out of a partnership between the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Council on Aging. So our whole foundation is based on partnerships, and that's what we try to do is bridge across disciplines and sectors to help promote creative expression as vital to healthy aging. So to do that, NCCA supports and helps develop best practice. We do education, technical assistance, and try to provide capacity building activities along with some small leadership and um, site grants. We promote research and development. In fact, we now have a research center part of NCCA, the Research Center on Arts and, and Culture, which originally was founded by Columbia University. And then we're very active in policy, helping to promote proactive policy to engage resources to better improve the quality of life of all our citizens but especially around the issues of aging and aging in community. So our three protocols for our work uh, are health and wellness activities, lifelong learning activities, and community engagement. Now for this project, we are honored to be the facilitator. And so it's uh, indeed a privilege to help uh, administer and gather the activities under the umbrella of the participating affinity groups. Well, thank you for uh, pulling this all together. This has been a, a wonderful endeavor. Tim, I'm going to turn to you as a, an example of the great work that's being done out there uh, that we should all know more about. You're the founder of an innovative model called Engage, the Art of Active Living. And the art part of the title is not an accident. Uh, tell us a little more about Engage, how it works, and how the arts are linked to it. Sure. Uh, Engage, in essence, what we do is change aging by transforming retirement communities through the use of, of arts and wellness, lifelong learning, civic engagement, community building, intergenerational programs. And when I first started looking at, at retirement housing, I think as we all know, it's not necessarily a place we used to want to end up. Um, you know, it's been called the old folks home and, the, and the, the place on the hill. And when I walked into these places in the mid 90s, I noticed that a lot of what was going on were, were bingo and donuts, two things not, not very capable of, of inspiring higher ground for people and also not all that health inspiring either. And what I thought about was college. Uh, because college to me was a similar kind of a, a moment in time philosophically in life development is you're transitioning into a new phase of life. You're going from potentially a working or a living on your own type 
the place to moving into something. And when I went to college, someone handed me a catalog, and, and I opened that catalog, and it was a roadmap for all of the things I could do during this phase. And I thought, what if an older person moved into a community and someone handed them that, co that, that college catalog, and that's what we've created. We hire college-level professors, teachers, artists to teach on-site for free programming that happens on a semester basis just like college, and we use culminating events to get them to utilize the newfound skills in real-world ways. So for teaching a writing class, it's not just for the sake of writing. We put on a play. We put on a poetry slam. They do um, storytelling programs on our Experience Talks radio show and advance through levels. Um, again, on-site, eliminating the need for transportation. We're bringing the program to primarily very low-income seniors who would not normally access this type of programming um, in community college or community center situations. And, and we haven't eliminated bingo, but, but I'm well on the road. Uh, as a former bingo caller, I wish you all the luck on that one. Uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, one of your first participants has a particularly fascinating story. Could you tell us about uh, C.J. Johnston? Yeah, I, I met Clarence several years ago, and and he he's a, a extremely famous jazz drummer and someone who you could spend basically the rest of your life hearing his stories. He's he's toured the world with all kinds of amazing jazz musicians and and played for the Queen of England in the palace several times. So could talk your ear off about all of these amazing places that he's been. And as as we know, as artists especially age, the, their work tends to dry up. And I, we're based in Southern California, which is which is mecca for having people retire too young. It's 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 the center of the universe for ageism. And so Clarence found himself in a place where he wasn't really getting gigs anymore. Moved into one of our communities, and was really at a crossroads where his gigs were starting to dry up and really needed to still work because he, he needed to support himself and his family. Well, and as you as you talk about that, uh, I think on the next slide we have some photos of um, albums that he participated with, and yes, uh, certainly some of the, the, the great names in, in American jazz. And uh, on the next slide he also talks about uh, not having enough work to do. So how did he become involved in your programs? Did you did you seek him out, or uh, does he live in one of your communities? He he was introduced to me. We we have a partnership with Remo Drums in in Southern California. He was introduced to me by someone who knew him and moved into one of our communities because he wanted to one live in a more affordable place. And the community that he moved into is called the Burbank Senior Artists Colony, which has. Uh, performance spaces and a theater and art galleries and and a community filled with people who he could really relate to um, and and this idea of not getting enough gigs I mean the way CJ actually said it was I can't get arrested out there and and you know here is someone who has toured the world with all these famous musicians and because he's gotten to a certain age they tend to look past him like he he never existed in the first place. And I think that this is something that is a, a parable or a metaphor for how we view aging in this country anyway, because we don't tend to want to look directly at it. We, it we're a society that tends to, to put it away and put it aside, and we're a very youth-oriented culture. And uh, tell us a little bit more about his uh, story. Is, what is he doing, and how how does he interact with the other folks there? Is he typical of, of folks that uh, you have participating in your programs? He's 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 not necessarily typical. I, I mean, the the reason I like Clarence's story, and Mark will talk uh, in a bit about encore. The the word encore is a is a pretty powerful word, and and the tagline second acts for the greater good. What happened with with Clarence is I. I set up a meeting with the director of education for Remo Drums, a guy named John Fitzgerald, who's the, the, the lengthy gray-haired gentleman in the photo playing the cowbell with, with Clarence leading a drum circle. And I thought 
I was introducing them to create a partnership. And what ended up happening was Clarence was John's drum teacher through his teen years. Um, so they had not seen each other in 30 years, but Clarence w produced John <laughs> as, as a drummer and an artist. And so what we did was we went to the Pacern Foundation in Southern California, and they have an artist outreach program where they support older artists and basically repositioned Clarence's skills and sent him to drum facilitation training. So Clarence started facilitating drum circles for our communities and has created a little business around the ability to to, to facilitate drum circles. So it was something that he had never really done before. He had worked with Remo on the other side as a, as a jazz musician and became a teaching artist, um, not only for our organization, but for others. And this is an example, I think, of, of what can happen when we look at, at boomers and, and even the older generations in terms of you have skills that can be applicable to something else and repurpose them and provide them with a sense of, of again, giving back and, and having success in later life. Could Before we move on, could you tell us more of, a little about how philanthropy both has been, you already mentioned uh, the Pacern Foundation, but also how philanthropy at the local or national level could be involved in, in programs like this uh, to support these kind of efforts? Well, I, I think that we're, we're a member of the National Center for Creative Aging, and I serve, thankfully, on their board. And, and the idea of, of arts and culture and aging coming together makes unbelievable sense. Um, and I think that philanthropy has, has been very supportive of what we do. I think we're considered a model program for how creativity and lifelong learning can play into older adulthood. And I think it's about behavioral change, basically. The idea of taking the later years of your life and changing your behavior to take on healthier habits and have that result in improved health and lengthened independence. I think that that's the type of thing that, that foundations are looking for. Philanthropy, obviously, it's a lot of it is about results and outcomes, and this is the type of program, and a lot of the NCCA's member organizations are, are doing amazing work around the idea of really changing aging and what people do as they get older. Well, you're certainly right that this is one of the, the great national examples of a successful program, and we thank you for that. Uh, as we go to the next slide, we'll turn to Mark and, uh, and Encore. Uh, let's turn to you and the Encore idea. Could you, could you tell us more about what you mean by that notion and what Encore.org is trying to accomplish? Oh, thanks, John. I, I also just want to express my relief I, that Tim is uh, eradicating bingo on the retirement community front, but not donuts. I, <laughs> the one article I cut out of the Sunday New York Times yesterday was the one about the best donuts in America being in Louisville. <laughs> so I'm, I'm breathing a sigh of relief. At, uh, at Encore.org, which is uh, is our new name, we, we've been for the last 15 years Civic Ventures. We, we've been trying to build a movement of people who want to have as, uh, as the tagline says, second acts for the greater, greater good, essentially uh, uh, second careers that are at the intersection of passion, purpose, and a paycheck, essentially a hybrid between social impact and, and work. Um, and through research uh, sponsored by the MetLife Foundation, we've discovered that already 9 million Americans between 44 and 70 have shifted into those chapters, uh, 31 million more give it give doing so top priority, but are struggling with the transition into that period. A lot of them are turning to entrepreneurship. Uh, an additional study uh, also funded by MetLife Foundation showed that a quarter are um, wanting to become encore entrepreneurs, uh, not only creating something uh, new, but also something new that has uh, a focus on solving social problems. And so we're we're really trying to support that movement uh, to tell the stories of the people who've already um, acted on that impulse and to try to help uh, the those who who want to do the same thing go from aspiration to action. 
And I, obviously, one of the things that many folks in our audience will be familiar with is the Purpose Prize. And tell us a little bit about how the Purpose Prize fits in into this work. And uh, could you talk about the origins of it and your experience over the last seven years? Uh, sure. It, you know, the Purpose Prize was really designed to be blasphemous, it, it, to really to attack most of the prevailing wisdom about what older people are capable of, what what they're doing. Uh, not just uh, the the notion that when you hit your 60s, you're over the hill and out for yourself, uh, but e- even more that even if you're uh, if you're making a valuable contribution, um, older people are not entrepreneurial, innovative, creative, uh, and so we we um, we wanted to show that that social entrepreneurship um, was far from the exclusive province of young people. Uh, launched the prize in 2006 in collaboration with the John Templeton Foundation and Atlantic Philanthropies. Uh, we really designed the prize together. They they were the two foundations that have been the initial funders and and um, and the main supporters ever since and it's it's for social innovators creative problem solvers who are over 60 they could start their innovation after 50 but in order to win the purpose prize you you have to be 60 or older we worried in the first year whether we would throw this uh, this party uh, and and it is quite a party five people each year win hundred thousand dollar prizes it was designed to be like the MacArthur Genius Awards, but for people in this stage of life. And and from the get-go, there was a tremendous response. We had 1,200 nominations the first year, um, and we had to scramble and create 10 smaller prizes and almost 50 Purpose Prize fellows. In fact, we had a number of MacArthur Genius Award winners in the fellows group. And it's it's uh, for people who are, you know, to go back again to what uh, Tim was saying, are really taking – lessons that they've learned from life skills um, and applying them to social problem solving. Many of them are doing it in the arts. Uh, one of my favorite is a winner from the second year in 2007, Gene Jones, who uh, who started his innovation at the age of 84. He was active in the American Symphony Orchestra League, went to their conference and went into a, a panel discussion that was about how the arts were used being used to uh, to improve the circumstances of low-income students. That was based on the work of Howard Gardner at Harvard about multiple intelligence. And so he returned to Tucson um, and started Opening Minds Through the Arts, which serves almost 20,000 children a year. Um, when, he, when he won his prize, he was uh, already uh, 90. And um, uh, it just, it's just an example around about how creativity, how social entrepreneurship knows no age boundary. Well, we're going to talk about uh, some examples uh, now, but I want to alert the audience that you can go ahead and put in uh, any uh, questions you have for our panelists uh, in writing on the – there's a a box on your screen that has a list, a place for you to ask questions. So um, Please do that if you want me to direct the question to uh, one of our panelists or another. Uh, please do that. But go ahead and start doing that now, and I'll be answering the questions as we wrap up the uh, presentation part. So uh, back to you, Mark. Uh, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to show the, the video with uh, Dr. Hubert Jones, but could you tell us a little bit about his story and how that illustrates uh, the Encore program? Sure. Uh, Hubie Jones is a, a social work professor who was – a mentor to the two founders of City Year and has long served on the board of of City Year. And as he moved into his 60s, he created the Boston Children's Chorus as an attempt to bring young people from diverse backgrounds together through the arts uh, to show uh, what community could look like in Boston and to be a, a a bridge builder. Um, it's it's been an enormously successful program. One of the reasons I wanted to show the video of Hubie Jones, which is you can find on YouTube by just going to Hubie Jones Purpose Prize and Marigold. Uh, it, it was produced for us by a film company, Participant Media, which is the uh, the film company of Jeff Skoll, the founder of the Skoll Foundation, one of the founders of eBay. They've made Lots of films, including The Help last year, Contagion, uh, uh, Waiting for Superman. At that, and last year they were the co-producer 
of the Best Exotic Marigold Hotel, which uh, is built around the premise um, of outsourcing the elderly, that that this uh, vast problem, this vast dependency ratio that we're purported to face by having so many people over 60 uh, all around the globe, that one solution would be to just send them all to a different country. If, you know, it's, it's very much satire and tells the story of how the, these people who move to India um, discover a new life, often a new career, uh, and, and it's kind of a re-coming of age story. So in conjunction with the film, a uh, participant wanted to do a contest to, um, to surface uh, the stories of people who were, who were finding new meaning and purpose and, and contribution in later life. Um, so that we created together the Marigold Ideas for Good contest, which for six months this past year gave f five $5,000 prizes each month to uh, a uh, an older person who had an idea to solve a significant problem in their community. And, and each month, one of the winners got a trip with Road Scholar, uh, formerly known as Elder Hostel, anywhere in the world, particularly a, a service trip. So it's an example of a, a, a creative organization, in this case a film company, um, which is uh, telling stories about uh, new kinds of roles for older people. In fact, they have a new film out called Promised Land, um, which is uh, tells the story of a character, a retired teacher played by Hal Holbrook, who leads a uh, grassroots uh, upheaval in a community to uh, to save them from being bought by uh, a company that wants to do fracking. So, um, so anyway, it's I think it's a great example not only of how the arts uh, can help reframe what this period of life is about, but how nonprofits can work with arts organizations uh, to help. Uh, extend that message. Uh, of course, the great, the great founder, in some ways, of the whole movement around creativity and the arts, uh, Dr. Gene Cohen, talked about the intersection of creativity and social change. Uh, is there evidence that this impulse is widespread? It, it, it is. You know, as I mentioned earlier, there's the um, the research that the MetLife Foundation funded showing that a quarter of uh, of uh, people moving into this stage of life are already there, want to become socially creative in the way that Gene Cohen described. And then there's even uh, academic research which supports uh, at a more fundamental level why this is all happening. Uh, David Gallinson, an economist at the University of Chicago, has studied the value of painting, sculpture, um, uh, literature uh, produced over a long period of time. He, he, he's uh, not a theoretician. He, he actually studies the real value of, of artwork sold in the market. And he's discovered that um, the most valuable work tends to come both from young people and from older people. And in trying to figure that out, he discovered it wasn't anything inherent about age, but actually styles of creativity that Young geniuses tend to be conceptual geniuses, and their work uh, blooms, you know, straight from their head in a sort of Mozart-like way. But experimental genius takes a long time, lots of trial and error, to be manifest. So Cezanne's most valuable work isn't done to his late until his late 60s. Louise Bourgeois's best sculpture doesn't happen till her 80s. And uh, and Gallatin has a theory that that you know that that's not by accident. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell has has written a lot about Gallatin, and he uh, he uses the example of Fleetwood Mac and the Eagles. The the Eagles have three greatest hits albums by the time they're 25, and Fleetwood Mac fails dismally in seven incarnations as a band, you know, until they have gray hair and kids graduating from high school, and then they sort of find their magic and reel off one after another the best-selling albums in rock history to that point. And, uh, you know, it's an illustration, I think, of why so many people moving into the second half of, of life are turning to creativity, innovation, entrepreneurship. And I think it turns on its head this notion that a much older society is inherently going to be a less creative one. I, I know you have a story about how Tech Town has been a spearhead of creativity in later life. Could you talk to a little bit about that? Yeah, well, Tech Town is in in uh, the Midtown section of Detroit, which is you know seen as a as a wasteland, and there are lots and lots of uh, of torn down buildings in that area. It, it, it's in a building itself, which was uh, the the building where the Corvette was invented. So it has a long history of of uh, creativity happening within it. It's an incubator now that was started by Wayne State. Um, 
uh, which is uh, and houses an office from the Kauffman Foundation in the very building, uh, and it's designed to promote entrepreneurship. And what struck me when I went there is how many of the entrepreneurs and innovators were older. Randall himself was in his 70s. Uh, he had been a jazz impresario earlier. Um, and I, I went that day to see uh, the business of a woman named Marion Jackson, a former art history professor at the University of Michigan and at Wayne State, who had um, adapted her earlier skills to uh, to create a business um, uh, developing traveling museum exhibitions of Brazilian art, uh, which had been her academic specialty. And it, you know, again, kind of goes back to what Tim Carpenter was talking about, about the repurposing of skills. I, as we've done our work, even through the Purpose Prize, there's been a lot less reinvention than one would think and, and much more uh, adaptation of, of earlier skills and applying them to new ends and, and doing so in creative ways. And I, what I loved about TechTown is that it was true of the building itself, this building from the 1920s. That was an example of adaptive reuse, and, and it was filled by individuals whose lives were examples of exactly the same thing. Are there global examples of this kind of social innovation in the second part of life? Very much so. That's, originally, the Purpose Prize was exclusively for American um, uh, women and men working in the United States. And over time, uh, as we opened it up to people from the United States working globally, we were enormously impressed by the nominations that were coming in. In fact, uh, one of the earlier ones that, that you showed in the slide was a winner last year, a woman named Jenny Bowen, who was the winner of the Purpose Prize that's given out each year for the person who's doing the most for younger generations, um, who's, who's uh, essentially a paragon of, of generativity. And our, Eric Erickson studied development in this stage of life said that the the high point was could be encapsulated in the phrase, I am what survives of me, and which is, I think, why so many of the Purpose Prize winners are using their ingenuity to benefit future generations. AARP has sponsored this prize. Jenny Bowen adopted two girls from China and discovered that they had been um, uh, bereft of human contact in orphanages in that country and, and the st started the Half the Sky Foundation, which has had such remarkable results that the Chinese government has invited them to train all 60,000 orphanage workers in China. But just an example of, of the kind of scale that some of these uh, winners are, are tackling and how, um, how they're having a, an impact uh, around the globe. Well, wonderful. And uh, let's see, shall we go on to the next one and talk about uh, how the Encore Talent Pool can contribute to the effectiveness in arts and cultural organizations, uh, either in, in a whole variety of ways, uh, beyond social innovation and entrepreneurship? I, I, I'm glad that, that you raised that, John, because, you know, in addition to talking about how creative people can be in this stage of life or how film and the arts can help reshape this uh, uh, changing image of older people. I, I do think that there is a, an important role that people in this stage of life repurposing their skills can play in strengthening arts organizations. Um, one example, we've been involved over the past couple of years in uh, creating a program called the Encore Fellowship, which is essentially an internship for grown-ups. It started with former HP employees in areas like marketing and human resources strategy who wanted to shift into the social sector, bring with their earlier skills, but apply them to new ends. And that program's uh, been growing by leaps and bounds. Last year, Intel announced that every single retirement eligible employee in the United States could do an Encore Fellowship. They'd pay the full 25000 and cover COBRA coverage during that period. And I, I'd like to see more programs like that bringing um, uh, management skills into the social sector uh, from people who've essentially learned those skills on, on somebody else's dime and bring them to, uh, to this purpose. I think arts organizations uh, could really benefit from that. I say that as a former uh, managing director of a, uh, of a modern dance company that could have used a lot more management skills than I was able to bring. Um, can you take a, a step back? and talk about the broader implications of so many talented people reaching this new phase of their life, 87 million people. 
uh, in the baby boomer generation uh, in their middle years and and still thought of by many, uh, including many professionals in the field of aging, as being over the hill. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I think we're we're in the midst of a of an extraordinary um, design project right now um, that's comparable only to the creation of adolescence a hundred hundred years ago. We, we've got almost ten thousand people a day flooding into their sixties, um, but they're in a confused state. They're no longer in midlife, but they're they're not uh, in a uh, dependent, frail stage like so often uh, is portrayed. And I, I think actually they're the denizens of, of an entirely new stage of life that doesn't have a name yet. We give it these oxymoronic titles, the young, old, the working, retired, um, 60s, the new 40. On the other hand, and you get senior discounts at 60. They, it, it, so in some ways, it's like the old 80. And I, I think 60 is the new 60, and the people who are flooding into that period are really pioneers. Um, in much the way 100 years ago, we, um, we had all these young people who were no longer children, but they weren't adults, and we created adolescence. And the, the irony is that the person who created adolescence was a 60-year-old, uh, the psychologist G. Stanley Hall. And 20 years later, he said he'd made a big mistake. He wished he had created a new stage of life between midlife and old age, uh, which he described as an Indian summer, and said that human beings didn't reach the height of their capacity until the shadows started slanting eastward. So, you know, it's 100 years later, and we've got this population explosion of people entering this period. And it's really a remarkable opportunity to design that phase of life so that People have more meaning and purpose, continued income, and and um, can contribute all of their accumulated experience. And I think it's so important, not just because the numbers of baby boomers are flooding into that period, but because they're just the first of an ongoing wave. You know, half the kids born since 2000 in the developed world are going to see their 100th birthday. So if we can get it right for the baby boomers, uh, everybody coming on their heels will benefit as well. Well, we certainly hope everybody does because uh, I, among others, are in that group. <laughs> uh, well, and thank you uh, so much. And now we'll, we, we'll turn to the questions from, from the audience. We have a number of questions already. But uh, once again, if you go to the, uh, the, the box on your screen, you will see a question section, and you just type in the questions, and I'll be passing those on to our audience. So the first couple uh, are, are for Tim. Actually, one's a shout-out, and then the other one's uh, a question. So, uh, Tim, someone uh, has uh, written in to say that they love your Facebook page. Uh, so uh, as we move to the next slide, you'll be able to see the information about how to contact each of the, the folks. Uh, but here's the question for you. Uh, and it's about, I think, the question you probably get the most, which is about the demographics of the project uh, that you work in. I think most people are surprised that it, most of the folks who are in your uh, facilities are, in fact, low income, uh, that this is not a high-level academic setting that, that you have. Uh, is there an ideal demographic for this? Is there a, a, um, a, a specific mix of folks that you're looking for uh, in these to make this project work the best? Well, what we've tried to do over the years is really serve seniors across a broad socioeconomic spectrum and and we've started to move into moderate and market rate projects as well in the last few years the we we have one art, artist colony open in the city of Burbank and two more opening in the next month. Uh, one in the Arts District of, of North Hollywood, the NoHo Arts District in Los Angeles, and another in, in the city of Long Beach. The NoHo project is what's called a mixed income project where 20% of the units are deeply affordable for low income artists and the other 80% are market rate. So that way we're serving a population across what we hope will be a, a much broader spectrum. And then the Long Beach project will actually be the first fully affordable, 100% affordable model uh, for artists. And the, the artist colony really was around this, the, the concept of let's change the only dynamic that people have in common in these communities as being old. 
because that part of it to me was never very interesting. The idea that the only thing someone has in common living in, in retirement housing is that they're over a certain age doesn't produce the greatest neighborly relationships and conversations. So he wanted to take age out of the equation and replace it with arts and learning and wellness, something that, that people can, can have more interesting and and fruitful neighborly relationships around. We used to joke when we first started developing with the artist colony in Burbank that instead of going next door to borrow a cup of sugar, you'd go next door and get script notes or comments on, on the poem that you're working on. And that actually happens in, in these buildings. But in terms of ideal demographics, what I like are stories, you know, we have people of, of, of every culture, ages from late 50s all the way up over 100. So we have two generations of, of older adults that we're serving now. And to me, the demographics of it are less important. And the more important thing is to try and shift the idea of what demographics mean in terms of what people are capable of doing, and, and especially in older age, because there is this message that we tend to send to older adults that they're not worthy or they're not good enough, they're not artists, they're not learners. And we're trying to change that by virtue of giving them access to high-level programming and then also having them take responsibility for their own aging process by becoming partners and being able to do that. So, in, you know, in the arts, a lot of times our first conversations are, are hearing the I'm not a writer, I'm not a painter, I'm not an actor, and changing that perception to you can do anything you want. Well, that was going to be my follow-up question. Uh, you know, I, I certainly have a, a long-standing, uh, fairly passionate interest in music. You don't necessarily want to hear me sing. Uh, <laughs> so, how, how do you how do you balance those things? Is, is everyone uh, ex expected to participate actively, or there is there an audience function in, in these communities? Uh, how, how does that that uh, mix work in these in these places? One of the, one of the advantages of where where we have have gotten to we we've been doing this now for 15 years and when we first started the communities were given to us and they were they were almost always ill designed for the types of intellectual amenities that we wanted to bring so now we're involved on the front end of the project and and the design elements I mentioned the aspects in the artist colonies you know you're starting to see in retirement housing now theaters and classes classroom spaces and media labs and art studios and all of the things that actually should have been designed in the first place, fitness centers that are actually age appropriate with training around how to actually use fitness equipment. Uh, so there, there are typically three types of people who, who live in our buildings. There are the people who are already doing it, you know, from the arts in the arts buildings, there are people who are never held a job, artists, and they've always been practicing it, and this is a great way for them to continue. There are also people who are dusting off their dreams and trying it for the first time, and that could be arts, that could be lifelong learning, it could be learned health behavior where, you're, where you start to take an interest in fitness and, and eating well and and fresh food growing. We, we consider creativity across a wide spectrum of things. And then also there are people who live there because it's an affordable place to live. It's a, it's a nice location. There is an audience aspect to it. And participation in the arts doesn't necessarily mean that you have to create art. It could also be you are, you are attracted to it and want to watch and, and cheer on your fellow residents. That's that's really a, a phenomenal approach to this and, and very inspiring. Uh, Mark and, and actually Tim, uh, the next question is, uh, I think, for you that um, what recommendations do you have for communities that are already experiencing larger ratios of seniors who are over 65 uh, than other communities in their states? There, there are places where there has been uh, retirement going on for a long time. Um, and the example is actually an interesting one, Austin, Texas, which is a community I know uh, well, having gone to school there, uh, that it is becoming one of those uh, places where older people either are already there or they're moving forward, and it's, uh, it's above the state average. 
uh, and yet the community is not uh, really capable at this point of, of meeting those those needs. So what recommendations do you have for uh, either funders or others uh, in, in terms of trying to uh, those work in those communities that are already above the mean in terms of, uh, of their needs? Well, I, you know, I think communities can do a lot to help engage the talent in this segment of the population. You know, we already know that the interest is strong, um, but but it's hard even when you're in your own community once you've left whatever you were doing in mid midlife uh, to reengage. It, it is that kind of improvisation, uh, but not in the best sense. And so, I think um, communities that want to continue to be attractive to older people for the economic benefits um, could also do a lot to become um, a good places for people to engage. Uh, Phoenix is a wonderful example where the Piper Trust has done a terrific job creating better pathways to, to purpose for people, community college initiatives. Uh, they just gave out the Encore Prize last week for the nonprofits in the community that they were that were doing the best to to uh, make use of the talent in this population. Uh, they've uh, been a, a place where Encore Fellowships has flourished. So I, I think that there is a kind of a new vision of, of, of kind of best places to, to move as you grow older that turns the old idea of, uh, you know, a place where you can live out um, uh, a, a, a years of R and R to a place where you can do some of your most important work. In fact, the Milken Institute came out with a study a couple of months ago, which looked at the best places in the country to grow older and made this kind of engagement one of the central features. Uh, Gay or Tim, anything to add to that? I think from from our perspective, there's there, uh, the communities need to look at almost a hardware and software combination. You know, the hardware meaning what does your community look like in terms of responding to an aging population, um, what, how do businesses respond to it, how, to, how do where people live respond to it. I was actually in Austin this year, and we're, we're expanding our programs to Austin. And Austin is interesting because it's, it's developing a bit on both ends of the spectrum because it's also a bit of a tech hub. And we had we met with um, sort of the tech community, uh, community foundations down there, and it obviously is a vibrant cultural town. And for what we're trying to do in terms of learning and creativity, Austin, and places like Austin, like Minneapolis, and the Research Triangle of of, of North Carolina and Portland, Oregon, Boulder, Colorado, a lot of the college type towns that tend to be mid-sized and, and have a strong cultural root to them tend to be the first responders for the types of things that we, we are trying to do in combination of, of the physical amenities of retirement housing matching a program that, that provides software to involve the older adults, not just inside those communities themselves, but in the community at large. The NoHo project that we're, we're opening in a few weeks here has an open to the public theater in the lobby. So there's an 80 seat theater with a box office and a marquee where we're housing a theater company in partnership with us to run their season of shows. And in return for drastically reduced rents, they're going to provide internal programming to the seniors that live there and school children in the area. So we'll have intergenerational theater programming in the building. So seniors who are artistically inclined towards performance can actually walk downstairs and perform on stage. Really, really wonderful things, and, and I think also fits into the uh, the general trend that we're seeing in lots of uh, programs of interest in livable communities or age-friendly communities or a variety of other terms that people use that uh, really get at the notion that you want a community that's better for everyone to live in, and there we know some things about what makes a community like that, and it turns out that you know, uh, involvement in the arts is something that we can do to, to help move that forward. Um, 
we're going to be uh, looking at the, the end of our uh, session in just a moment, but I have sort of one last question for each of you uh, as we move uh, forward with this. Uh, so I, I'd like to ask you to, to talk about what it is you think that uh, philanthropy, either at the local or national level, can or should be doing uh, to, to foster these efforts uh, in in pulling communities together around these issues. So, uh, Gay, why don't I start with you? Oh, thank you, John, and thank you, Tim and Mark. Wonderful to hear your presentations once, once again and expanding and ever-changing. Uh, well, truly, uh, the, going back to the purpose of this project, is really to encourage funders to look across their portfolios. Look at, uh, we're really not asking for the creation of new funding streams or really uh, more work for your limited staff, but to look how uh, the funding in the arts can be leveraged with funding in aging and health, and that the solutions are coming, as Tim and Mark explained, really from this cross discipline, cross-cultural, cross-community effort, because it seems the essence of it is to realize the new demographics around longevity, because the boomers are here for sure, but the issues of longevity will be with our society ongoing, thank goodness. So it really does impact all ages, all communities. And uh, so from our point of view, we look forward to working with you on how to, to look at your existing projects and seeing how they can be leveraged and enhanced through combinations of fundings, partnerships, and collaborations. Mark? Well, I um, I had two thoughts. Um, one is really around the idea of, of innovation. You know, when you look back at the last 50 years, we, we just had such a spectacular run around innovation in later life, for, you know, from policy innovations like Social Security and Medicare through things like retirement communities and senior centers and AARP, and you could go on and on, lifelong learning. And it really made that period of life uh, go from a desert to a destination. And I think, you know, as we've got so many people flooding into this period kind of between midlife and old age, this new stage. And, uh, you know, as, as Gay was saying, it's going to be an ongoing phenomenon. I think we really need to be out experimenting with new kinds of, uh, of social institutions. Tim talked about education earlier. I think we need school for the second half of life uh, to help prepare people for what they're going to do next, for who they're going to be next. So I think it's, it's, a, it's you know, a once-a-century opportunity to, to experiment, and philanthropy is in such a unique position to, to promote that kind of social innovation. So I, I would say that's key. And then the other point, just to make um, kind of more substantively, is I, I'd like to see philanthropy promote um, generativity, this this idea of, of older people investing in the well-being of, of future generations. You know, it's, a, it's what we see with grandparents all the time, and, and yet, oddly, for many decades, we turned that on its head and we told older people to essentially have a second adolescence, not not to be there for young people, but to be young themselves. And there's, you know, nothing wrong with being youthful, but I think we we really could do more to help people at this stage of life, uh, not just leave a legacy, but to live one um, through these new kinds of social innovations and also through um, telling the stories of, of people who are, are doing that kind of investment in the future. Tim? I think it's a unique moment in time for for aging in America. It, for me, the, the role that philanthropy could play is to further get us to look at this in a mature way as a mature society. Because I think that, you know, Mark mentioned Marigold Hotel. There's there's so many great examples of films. There's another one called Starlet coming out, I think, in either this weekend or the following weekend, where our, our society is starting to record Require and ask for higher levels of thought, and, and you know we went 
this pendulum swung so far away from that for so long that the idea of just supporting a more mature way of looking at this stage of life and to rethink it and to allow some organizations that are doing this kind of work flexibility to be able to respond to how it changes as well. I think that this is an ongoing, highly volatile thing. That, you know, obviously we've been through a fairly tough economic time, and we might still be going through a, a tough economic time. So the idea that that how people respond to that at any age, but you know, Betty Davis said it probably best as aging is, is it ain't for sissies. So obviously it's tougher the older you get and the less money you have to deal with it. Um, and I think that your your example, John, of Austin, you know, I think that there are lots of places in every state in the union that could be considered retirement destinations. And I think in terms of certainly community philanthropy, I, I think it's a, it's going to be the biggest thing that happens in decades because the boomers are there are so many of them it is such a, a demanding generation and I speak as one that we are not going to go quietly and that good night obviously we don't do anything quietly and and the ability to be able to provide support for organizations that can respond to that and continue to be light on their feet and and react and be flexible to it, I think would be a great way for for philanthropy to respond to it. Well, I want to thank our our guests today, uh, Tim Carpenter, Mark Friedman, and J. Hanna, all of whom are pioneers in this effort of uh, pulling together what are often thought of as completely different efforts. Uh, and certainly in philanthropy are thought of as completely separate funding streams. So we want to thank you for everything each of you does every day to make life better for older adults and their families. We also want to thank the John A. Hartford Foundation, uh, the MetLife Foundation, Grantmakers in the Arts, and Grantmakers in Health for their support of the program today, as well as the American Society on Aging for their technical expertise.